don't leave me alone, O my faithful shepherd. Guide me, dear Master, be unto me a helper. I am, O Lord, without you, nothing at all. O Lord, without you, nothing So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. And don't leave me alone in the midst of this darkness. Let your bright face guide, O Lord, unto peace. I am, O Lord, without you, not at all. I am, O Lord, without you, nothing at all. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. No, don't leave me alone, but hear my prayers, and be there for me, Lord, for the rest of my life. I am, O Lord, without you, not at all. I am, O Lord, without you, nothing at all. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. And don't leave me alone because of my sins, but forgive me, O Lord, and accept my repentance. I am, O Lord, without you, no. I am, O Lord, without you, nothing at all. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. No, don't leave me alone in the midst of this world, but come quickly, O Lord, and take me to heaven. I am, O Lord, without you, not at all. I am, O Lord, without you, nothing at all. So take my right hand, 
O Lord, and guide me in your way forever. So take my right hand, O Lord, and guide me in your way In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Yesterday we spoke about some styles for evangelism, or preaching, or telling others about Christ. So how many styles we spoke about? Nine. What are the nine styles? <laughs> no, 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 no. Huh? Prophetic proclaimer. Intellectual, storyteller, testimonial, service, service. invitational, interactive, power. and power. Very good. Very good. Uh, today we'll speak about another actually. Uh, topic, but it's also related to evangelism, which is obstacles to evangelism. Uh, I received email two days ago about, you know, we have been doing this convention for 14 years, but where are we from evangelism? So, until now, you know, the church is mainly serving the Coptic community, people from Egyptian background. So, why our church is not expanding? Why our church, expanding meaning, you know, accepting people from other cultures. And if the church is the icon of heaven, we say the church is the icon of heaven, how heaven looks like. Actually, heaven is multicultural. I'm sure you know the song, which is taken from the book of Revelation, from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, from every race. That's heaven. So actually, the church should be multicultural, from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue, from every race. As long as the church is closed for one culture, then there is defect in evangelism. So, here there are some obstacles. Uh, I will discuss with you seven obstacles that may be the reason of hindering evangelism, or maybe there are other obstacles, but this is the obstacle you know, that I like to discuss with you today. The first one, I, I call it improper view of evangelism. Improper understanding of evangelism. Improper perception of evangelism. Uh, I think our perception about something definitely has a great effect on how we approach this issue. How you understand it, or how you perceive it, definitely will affect your approach to this issue. So, let us see what the Bible tells us 
about evangelism. Uh, Saint Paul, he was a man of God, and he was bold in evangelism. In spite of the stoning, the beatings, the prisons, even death. Why? Why he, he was so zealous about evangelism? If we read in Romans chapter 1, hear what St. Paul said. I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the proper, uh, sorry, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, here St. Paul said, I am under obligation. I am under obligation. He understood that to evangelize and to preach, it's not an option. It's not a choice. It is obligation. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. When St. Paul understood that he is obliged to preach. That's why he continued to preach in spite of all, you know, the threats, the beatings, the stoning, the death that he faced in his life. But why St. Paul felt obliged? Why he said, I am under obligation? Actually, the Greek word that was translated under obligation, it has the meaning of I am indebted. I owe something to somebody. So if I am indebted to you or I owe you something, then I am obliged to pay it back. St. Paul, actually, his life, he feel that, you know, he owe his life to God who saved him. He was actually about to lose his eternal salvation. But God saved him. God set him free. God led him to the right way. That's why he owes this to Christ. And because of, of this debt, he felt, you know, we, I am under obligation. I am indebted to preach the word of God. So the question here, maybe now we fail to evangelize because we fail to grasp that we owe our salvation to God. Maybe because we fail to know that we owe it to the lost to share the gospel with them. We owe it to the lost that we share the gospel with them. But here, listen to St. Paul's words, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who also in Rome. Why? I am under obligation. So, uh, if we don't evangelize, if we don't preach, this means we would be keeping something from its rightful owner. We are keeping this from people who own it. That's why the first point about evangelism, we need to know that evangelism actually is not optional. It's obligation, but obligation of love. Obligation because I owe my salvation to Christ. That's why I need to preach and to share the good news of salvation with everybody else. 
The second obstacle is what I call it also the improper view of the gospel. Improper understanding or perception of the gospel. Again, if we go to the same text that we read it from Romans chapter 1, St. Paul said what about the gospel? It is the power of God. I am not ashamed for the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Many times we feel that there are things are important for others than the word of God. For example, with what's going now in Egypt, maybe many of us, we feel uh, we want to bring our families to live with us here in America. And we try to see different ways how to bring them because they need. And sometimes we feel we are obliged to do this for them. But if we feel that the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, then actually, I will feel that that's what I will want to give, not only to my family, but to my family and to my friends and to the enemies and to everybody else. As I perceive America like it's heaven to protect people from persecution or from suffering or whatever, and I want to bring people here, if I believe that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, it is the true heaven for our salvation, then actually I would like to share it with others. But maybe you are simply lacking confidence in the power of the gospel. Maybe we have very low expectation in evangelism. We don't see how the word of God can transform people's life and can change people's life. Or maybe sometimes not only we have low expectation, maybe we have negative expectation. Negative expectation means we don't think only that nothing will come out of evangelism, but also maybe uh, something bad will result. For example, we'll be rejected, we'll be ridiculed, we'll be mocked. So we don't receive, perceive the gospel as it is truly the power of God for salvation. That's why we are not eager to, to share the, 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 the gospel with others. But St. Paul, he said, you know, I am eager, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. So uh, St. Paul here actually, he felt uh, not only under obligation, but also he felt eager to share the gospel since it is the power of God. The third obstacle for uh, evangelism is improper view of priesthood. Improper view of priesthood. Usually when we see our church is not multicultural or we don't have uh, people from other culture joining the church, we come to blame the hierarchy of the church to blame the priesthood, the, 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 the bishop, the clergy. Why? Because it is their responsibility to do the evangelism. But actually this is improper view of priesthood. Because evangelism is not only the responsibility of the priests. Yes, it is one of our responsibilities. But it is the responsibility of every believer. 
When the Lord said, and you will be witnesses for me, he did not say this only to the priests. Actually, it is the responsibility of everybody. So before blaming others, ask yourself, what did I do to share the word of God with others? What did I do to preach the gospel of Christ to others? <clears throat> Actually, in Ephesians chapter 4, when he spoke about the gifts, the uh, gift of leadership in the church, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be pastors, some to be uh, teachers, and some to be shepherds. These are the five gifts of leadership in the church. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and uh, shepherds. If you think about why God gives these gifts, he said to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So who will do the work of ministry? It is the believers. But the leaders of the church, their actually role is to equip the believers, the saints, for the work of ministry to build and to edify the body of Christ. So the role of the clergy is equipping, preparing, preparing the believers. So you will go and preach. And if you continue to read this passage from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, he said, speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, every joint is very important, with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So here, the focus on everybody doing its part. It's everybody doing its share. It's not only the priests, it's not only the clergy, it's not only the servants, but everybody has the responsibility to do this. In Acts, one second, in Acts chapter 8, when there was a great persecution after the martyrdom of St. Stephen, what will happen? We read that all those who were scattered, these were believers, they went to doing what? They were sharing the gospel, preaching the word of God with others. Think about St. Stephen himself. St. Stephen was appointed as a deacon for the service of the tables. Right? Why they appoint the seven deacons? You know, they said, it's not proper for us to leave the word of God and serve tables. So let's appoint seven deacons. So that's the main ministry. But St. Stephen felt he is only limited to the service of the tables. No, he was preaching because he felt obliged. He was under obligation. He was eager. So he has a proper understanding of evangelism, has proper understanding of the gospel. It is the power of God of salvation. And also has proper understanding that not only the priest should be evangelist, but everybody, even if it is not in the job description as a deacon to preach, but he felt obliged to preach. And we have his sermon recorded to us uh, in, in, um, in Acts chapter 7. And he was preaching and arguing different sects and different groups, indicating to them that Jesus is God. So actually, preaching and evangelizing is the responsibility of each one of us. And before you ask why the other person did not evangelize, ask yourself why I did not evangelize. Why I am ashamed to share the word of the gospel. St. Paul actually he said, I am not ashamed to share the word of gospel because it is the power of God. So are we ashamed or we are eager and we feel we are under obligation to share the word of God. Yes, Paul. Is there a difference between uh, fantastic words and saying that the devil is deceiving? Uh, if a Christian is saying that the devil is deceiving, 
try to tie different thoughts, thank you, when we try to tie different thoughts together about how the priesthood is not necessarily to be blamed for the lack of a multicultural church, that the responsibility falls upon the entire congregation, the priest's responsibility is to prepare the people for that, that mission. Yet we don't really see that quite honestly in the Coptic Orthodox Church that exists today in most of this country. True, that's the purpose of retreats like this and we're trying to change that spirit, but the leadership does affect quite a bit within our, our congregation. We take direction and tempo from the priests. They kind of set the direction for us. If there's not support, it's not gonna be done. We could bring people to church, but if they're not welcomed, if they're not approached, if they're not greeted and welcomed back, if we don't, I 100% agree with you, uh, but the point here, uh, many, many of us sometimes we make suggestion and recommendation, but when it comes to me, I don't want to do it, you know, that's what I'm speaking about, you know, but again, what you said is correct, for example, if you bring people to the church and the church is closed even for a Bible study for these people, then what you would do, so I'm not saying, you know, uh, it's not our responsibility, and I'm washing my hand, I say I'm innocent 100%. No, I'm not saying this. But I, what I'm trying to say, we cannot just make recommendations and suggestions and do nothing. No, all of us, we should work together. We as priests and, and clergy and bishops and leaders, we should equip and prepare the, the soil, you know, for, for, for people. And the same way, you need actually to go and brings so we will work together as as Hadr. as as Saint Paul said in Ephesians chapter four the passage that I I said every part part does its share every part here includes the priest includes the clergy includes the bishop includes the leader of the church so I need to do my part and you do your part so if I am doing my part and you are not doing your part evangelism will be hindered the opposite is true if you are doing your part but me as a leader I'm not doing my part, also will be an obstacle. So what I'm saying, it is not only for the priest, but everybody, including the priest and the clergy, should do its, their part. Yeah. Okay? Well, we'll send them the CDs. I <laughs> 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 now it's not as complex in terms of um you know the length of the mass the um all the different traditions and all the different um the coptic language and um back then they just preached whatever they they wanted to preach and they just you know they did it in simplicity not as uh, actually it's it was not like this you know the, the problem of multicultures you know as you read in Acts chapter 6 the greek complained because the Jews, you know, and, and their widows, the widows of the Greeks, were not taken care of. And also, people from Jewish background, they came with the Jewish tradition. And actually, there was a, a theology, a Jewish theology, saying, unless you accept the Jewish tradition, you cannot be saved. So there was actually a conflict about what we should keep and what we should not keep from the, the Jewish tradition. And that's why the first council in Jerusalem met to discuss, should we ask the Gentiles to be circumcised or not? Should we ask them to, uh, from what sh they should refrain and what they should keep from the Jews? So this issue actually started from the, 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 the first church. The, uh, when you have more than one culture, you actually expect there are some uh, cultural clash will happen. And uh, people will will start to say, "What is Christian and what's culture?" You know, and this decision, as as the Bible teaches us, should be made with the council. You know, how they decided what's cultural and what's not cultural, what's Jewish tradition and what's not. They made the first council in Jerusalem, 
you know, and the, all the apostles met together and they discussed and they made a resolution about it. Because right now we see youth, you know, people, you know, just make this decision on their own, you know. That's the culture, remove it from the church. We, we should keep this, we should remove this. No, it has to be done by the council. And this again goes what Paul is saying. That is the role of the leadership in the church, you know, how to pave the way. And, and, and the word of, of St. James and St. Peter and the first Jerusalem Council, we should not burden, we should not put or lay heavy burden on those who are coming to the faith, you know. That that's actually should be the responsibility of the council of the church, the Holy Synod, to, to decide what's culture and what's not culture. And, and, and to keep in mind, we should not put heavy burden on, on the people who are coming to the faith. So, so you're saying it's okay to modify the way we do things now, just you have to get... Again, yeah. we, we need to look at what's culture and what's not culture. But who makes this decision? It's not made by, by, by people. It should be made by the Senate. Yes. Excuse me, this point is uh, very important uh, to understand. And uh, uh, what St. Stephen was uh, preaching is understandable. But uh, because there was a model in front of him at that time, St. Peter and uh, all the apostles, that they preached in front of him. So, yes, uh, the um, uh, function of the leaders I believe it's not only to equip people of doing this, but to lead by example. Absolutely. And, and yeah. this, uh, for me, excuse me, uh, maybe I don't find this currently. For example, I didn't find a bishop for, in the church dedicated for this evangelism. No, actually, there's and Bishop Paul, his actually title, uh, Bishop of Mission and Evangelism. I don't know this. Now you know. I, okay, <laughs> but, but, but it, it is not in public. What I mean, if I see uh, Bishop uh, X or Bishop uh, or uh, Pope uh, Tawadros is going to preach in Saudi or in North Korea, okay? This can be a good ex example, but we didn't see this. No, in, actually we uh, have. Uh, no, no, no. Maybe you don't know. We have Bishop Antonio Smoros uh, doing mission you know, in South Africa. And he started on all the continent of Africa. Then actually have Bishop Paul, he actually Bishop of Missions but in general. But we don't have evangelism just, just, in Egypt, just, which is just the uh, source just, of the church. Just listen to me. Uh, and, and Bishop Paul in Kenya. And uh, we have Bishop uh, Yusuf uh, in Bolivia, not me. And mm. Bishop <laughs> and Bishop Agason in Brazil. And b beside we have um, uh, Father from uh, El Baramos Monastery, Abuna Zakaria in, in Mexique, and another uh, uh, in, in the Bermuda. And we have Abuna Antonio Sikaribi in, in, in Caribbean islands. Uh, uh, we, we in, in, in Bishop Daniel of Australia, of Sydney, actually started a mission in Japan, and Bishop Surreal started a mission in Pakistan. So there are missions here. In Egypt, as you know, officially, it is prohibited, you know, to, to, to evangelize in Egypt. It was it, like this even just, just uh, early Let ages. me finish. <laughs> let me finish. Let me finish first. Now, it is officially, we cannot, you know, say we are preaching officially. But this does not claim it's a Christian to, 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 because there are many ways of, you know, as I said yesterday, many styles of, pre of preaching, you know. And actually, we hear every now and then, about people who converted to Christianity in Egypt, you know, and there are many uh, bishops, priests, who are serving these people, you know, how, how they are, uh, but, but we, we do, uh, they do it wisely in order for the church actually to continue. But, but yes, I'm sure you know and you hear uh, every day about people converting to Christianity. Yes. So I, I wanted to add also is that we cannot forget the, uh, the age and the presence of the Coptic Orthodox Church in the land of immigration. And we cannot forget the, uh, what the Coptic Orthodox Church is now in 2013 to what it was like 10, 15 years ago. So there is some uh, progression. 
we cannot expect to go from zero to 100 in a very short period of time. So we have to, there's a growing pain, growing presence outside of Egypt. We have been much, um, going through much progression and we will continue to progress. So we can't forget that. Yeah, and the Lord said, you know, again, I'm not saying this as an excuse again. Uh, our responsibility is to preach and the church should be multicultural. But, but as George was saying, the Lord said, you know, you need actually to be witness for me in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then to Samaria, then to the end of the earth. You know, when the Coptic church came here to America, number one, they should look at Jerusalem, you know, the Coptic people. You know, and it took some time in order to provide churches for all the people and to ordain priests and to provide for their ministry. You know, And this actually is the style of the apostles. St. Paul, when he went to any place, where he used to start, in the synagogue, among the Jews, you know, until they rejected him, then actually he went to the Gentiles. But thank God you did not reject us here, so that's why we are continuing to serve here. But uh, maybe, <laughs> anyway. Had I, yes. Uh, sorry, tap the microphone here. I will come back to you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Said so just a quick point of clarification. I think maybe re what Rez was um, referring to is how how Paul, no no Rez right. Um, is how do we make this information accessible to us, or is it readily accessible? I didn't know about a lot of these bishops as well and these missionary trips, and that might be, you know, obvious, obviously like a deficiency in my own search. But is it readily available, or, or yeah, it's, it's public information. <laughs> okay, is there like a unified resource with this? I, I know probably online, etc. But yeah, if you go to any Coptic website, y you will find this, and if you go to the Patriarchate website uh, or any any in website actually, okay. uh, and here in the Caesar Diocese, actually, for maybe the ba last uh, past uh, five or six years, every year we do like a mission trip uh, to one of the, we visited Bolivia, we went to Brazil, went to Mexico. Uh, next year, actually, we are going to Sudan. Uh, the year after, we'll go to Ethiopia. So, so we, we have a plan, and we'll be happy to have you with us in the mission trip. Yes. Um, the point I wanted to make, Yusayedna, is, um, you know, we've developed not, you know, the people here, but the Coptic community has developed a cultural phobia, and they perpetuate this. And I think that that is one of the obstacles of evangelism. If I have this un um, I, you know, that I, that I understand that there are certain things that our children and our community should not be involved in. But there's got to be some way to state that positively without negatively impacting the whole other cultures um, that they are the source of all these bad things. So w whether it's the hierarchy or the servants or so forth, and they perpetuate these phobias, and so of course, then why are we going to go out and, um, and try to bring these people in? I'm not sure about the culture phobia. Because actually, uh, we the Egyptians actually we like the khawagat. <laughs> and actually, in, in Egypt, for example, uh, I, I will explain this. You know, in Egypt, for example, I use uh, a child 11 or 12 years old, and he see a foreigner, you know, he go and try to greet him and communicate with him, even he doesn't know English, you know. So we are comfortable to, yeah, to, to speak to two foreigners, you know. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's funny here in America, uh, because we are here the foreigners, you know. And uh, when an American enters a church, so somebody goes to Abuna, Abuna, there is a foreigner outside. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we are the foreigners, not the... <laughs> But uh, I think it's not cultural phobia, but many of us perceive the church it's a place, uh, all of us, or not all of us, many of us have homesickness. And we miss, you know, the Egyptian culture. So when we come to the church, we find it is opportunity to overcome this homesickness. You know, that's why maybe we are not uh, uh, comfortable with, with, with the American or, you know, with the foreigners, <laughs> not because of the phobia, but because this will take from me, 
you know, the times that I enjoy it in my home culture, you know, because it's only, you know, the rest of the week I am dealing with Americans. I am, I'm not in, in the Egyptian island. So I want to go to this Egyptian island on the weekend to just take care of my homesickness. You know. But of course we need to deal with this. We need to deal with this because this will be, as Merlin said, a big obstacle because we will fight to keep the church, you know, a, a, an Egyptian island for my homesickness, not, not for anything else, just because I'm comfortable to speak in Arabic. I'm comfortable to speak about uh, Morsi, Egypt, <laughs> Sisi, or Now, that's what you know, I like to discuss. Now, I'm not going to discuss about uh, the shot of the government here. You know? That's not my business. Although I live here, but I'm speaking about you know, uh, what's going on. And, and that including their generation, not ours only. You know? I mean, that's La, the, the generation, no. That Second I mean, generation, no. Generation no problem. Of they, course, they need yeah, to speak so about the shot of the government, not that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Actually, um, if I may say, regarding the point about when people come foreigners or not foreigners to the church, um, I think we're just not used to welcoming. We're always thinking it's not my job as one of the congregation people to do it. It's really the priest's job or the priest's wife's job or this servant or that servant. But one thing I really loved when I went to Canada, when I went to Buna Bishoy's Salama's church, he actually announces and tells his people, the entire congregation, nobody's allowed to leave from the church if they are someone that you don't know. Um, in, you need to introduce yourself. And not only introduce yourself, you need to bring that person to Abuna and tell him, Father, this person is new to the church. Could, this person could be another Egyptian or a non-Egyptian. doesn't matter who's the person. But it's something that it became to be second nature for the people. So the, naturally, when they're standing in church, they just look to the right, to their left, who's in front of them, who's behind them, and when, especially when we do the holy kiss, and that's it. So if each one of us is aware of our four corners, we're, that's it, like we all became part of it. And I think it takes some encouragement from our priests. And I do admire a lot of our priests, honestly, and all of them, they encourage the congregation to do it, but we have this social phobia I can't talk to the person because I'm not from, you know, the servants, or I'm not a board, or I'm not a board member, or whatever. So I think it's just we need yeah, to approach our congregation. Yeah, this number three obstacle. When I said it is not the priest's job, no. you know, it is everybody's job. You know, when you see a foreigner coming to the church, or it could be go. another Egyptian that's not from yeah, my yeah. city yeah. or my church. You need to go speak with him, welcome him, make him feel home. That's your place, and this responsibility of, of everybody. Yeah, the priest should encourage this. Yes, I heard it. <laughs> and as a priest, as a priest, I'm encouraging you to do this in your churches. I'm doing this right now. Hmm? Yes. Actually, I'm holding the priest and the congregation accountable because you need to do it when you see a foreigner come to the church and also the, the priest. I understand we want to live here and laugh and chuckle, but the reality is tomorrow I go home and nothing's going to change in my church. So, honestly, this is a responsibility that I hope we Absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah and even if we are laughing, but yes, it's, it's yeah. responsibility. You are not taking lightly. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, that's the thing. <laughs> okay. I feel like I should probably say something as the foreigner in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, all of us are foreigners. You are I the figured, only one you know, the let me get the, our side of it too. Um, <laughs> what your grace said yesterday, I thought was a great idea. When I first, I came from a Baptist background, so when I first learned about Orthodox, you know, um, I didn't know anything or where to start or anything, and so um, I watched a bunch of sermons, and that helped. I think what you said yesterday about having a Bible study, start with a Bible study in your churches, is the best way. 
because even though I watch a ton of sermons and kind of had an idea when they went through a whole eight, uh, eight sermon uh, series on everything about the church, when I came to the liturgy for the first time, it was like, oh, okay, I don't know anything about what's going on. Exactly. So, so Bible study should be the starting point. And this actually is a common ground because whether you're coming from Baptist background or Catholic background or any background, you know, Bible, all of us. Yeah, it made me more comfortable. Exactly. And about the culture, we're afraid too. You know, like when I come in, you're not, you know, I'm like, okay, am I going to offend anybody? What do I wear? What do I say? How do I sit? Where do I stand? You know, I don't want, we're afraid too. We don't exactly. know what your yeah. culture is or if, you, if we're going to offend anybody or if anybody is going to welcome us or not. So, yeah, so it's, it's comes from both sides. Yeah, both sides. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Who, yes. Um, you mentioned making um, the visitors, making the visitors feel at home. How how do we do that when uh, so much of our uh, Egyptian culture permeates through our church services, and it's very hard to kind of um, grasp uh, what's going on, especially in the liturgy. I, there was a visitor who came uh, last year to to the church uh, down in Miami, and I remember sitting there trying to explain everything to him, but he had no time to listen to me and to look at what's going on and it's it seems and this goes what i said yesterday yeah. you know i'm again i'm against 100 mm -hmm. to invite somebody to the liturgy for the first time you know he will no, feel confused and lost yeah. you know but, but you need to invite him mm -hmm. to a bible study mm -hmm. and through bible study you know actually you start teach him about the the, the church through the bible Mm -hmm. For example, if I want to, to teach about the divine liturgy uh, to, to a people or, you know, who want to join the church, mm -hmm. I will never say I'm going to give you a series in the divine liturgy. I'm not going to say this. But I will do Bible study from the book of Leviticus. You know? mm -hmm. And then I will t uh, ex uh, tell them you know, how the priests they used to bring the sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle. You know? Why? To examine the sacrifice. And if the sacrifice is without blemish, then he will take to the altar and offer the sacrifice on the altar. Actually, in the divine liturgy, we will find they bring the sacrifice, the bread and the wine to the door of the altar. To do what? To examine it. Exactly. And he take the one without blemish to the altar to be a sacrifice. So here, actually, I'm doing Bible study in the book of Leviticus, but I'm explaining the divine liturgy. So when he comes to the divine liturgy and see Abuna standing there and another, you know, deacon presenting to him the, 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 the bread and the wine and Abuna smelling the wine, now he, he knows what he's doing. He's examining, you know. And little by little, he will understand the liturgy mm -hmm. from the scripture. Then after he comes to the literature after this, he will be comfortable. He doesn't want you to sit next to him to explain to him. Mm -hmm. you know, and he will be confused between listening to you and watching what's yeah. going on, mm -hmm. praying. You know, he, he, that's why, again, I repeat several times, I am totally against inviting somebody for the first time to liturgical service. You know, and, and, and that's the church what the church did. There was classes for the catacombs to teach them. You know, and after he is taught, you know, in any school, they don't take you mustn't, to a surgery room or an operation room before you learn four or five years. And then they take you. But if from the beginning they take you to the operation room, if you are study, studying medicine, this would be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. My voice is loud this time. <laughs> Just commenting on this, Sayyidna, I think this you know, just needs to be um, organized on uh, the churches. I, I don't know if there is something specifically, a Bible study done for people who are just coming new to the Orthodox Church. Because uh, maybe you get them to a normal Bible study um, and you know it's not uh, relevant to people newly joining the church. So maybe it needs to be something uh, organized uh, between the churches, that there's a Bible study specifically for this? I don't know if it exists or not. Uh, uh, it, yes, I agree. It has to be uh, organized. 
but uh, because we don't have a big inflow of, of Americans, that's why they do it. Uh, you know, for example, if a person is joining the church, they start to do it like one on one. But it has to be more organized. And uh, as, as Paul was saying, if we're thinking it seriously, then maybe we can uh, start like a, a, a campaign to invite people to a Bible study. And maybe we we'll just do this uh, invitation maybe, maybe over one month or, or 40 days. And the Bible study will start, you know, this course will start from, for example, November 1st to uh, uh, December 15. And this will be the Gospel of St. John. And through the Gospel of St. John, I can teach them doctrines, I can teach them sacraments of the church. It's a Bible study, you know. And then we do another campaign for another Bible study. We, we I think, Yes, it has to be organized and structured in a way so the, the, the people who will come, they, they know they come for one course, that's what they study, and at the end of the course, that's what I want to teach the people. That's the message. These are the points that I want them to get from this Bible study. Okay. Yes. I want to ask, do you think that the, uh, the Orthodox Church or the Coptic Church is supposed to be updated to be able to approach the, Amor the American community? Okay. Actually, the church is growing, but how the church will be growing? There are two ways to grow, either horizont horizontally or vertically. Horizontally means you need to do another foundation. But St. Paul said, no, there is no foundation other than what was laid, Jesus Christ, apostles, and uh, prophets. You know, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and uh, prophets, and Jesus Christ is a cornerstone. stone. So that's the foundation. So uh, I, I say the Coptic Church or the Orthodox Church should be a high-rising building, 21 stories. You know, so each story is like a century is built on the foundation of others. It's not a motel one story with 21 rooms. Each one has its own foundation, but it's high-rising high building. And will continue to grow, and will con to, ad to, to adapt to the culture, to understand the, the people, how to be attentive to the needs of the people. But this should be built on the foundation of 20th century rich her heritage and rich tradition. So, uh, Sayyidna, you, you, what is your expectation about the future of this church in the American community? The future? Actually, there are two uh, dimensions to answer this question. The first dimension is, I think what the American culture needs is orthodoxy. That's what the American culture needs in order to, to, to be saved. The, the orthodox message. Uh, why is the orthodox message? Because it's simply the true message. You know, as, as, as the theme of this conference, you know, uh, timeless truth for truthless times. But another thing is, among the obstacles, is the common enemy that, that uh, George spoke about yesterday, that's attacking not only the, the Orthodox Church, but attacking Christianity in general. All these secular ideas. And the danger about secular ideas is uh, they, they are selling or they putting the poison, but they are presenting, you know, they putting it in, in honey. What do I mean by this? Actually, I, I think atheism and all this secular, you know, ideology are more dangerous to the society from terrorism. You know, we are afraid from terrorism and we are fighting, you know, there is war against terrorism. But why I'm saying these are more dangerous? Because they are subtle, as George was explaining. The terrorists come, I say, I hate you, I want to kill you. So he defined himself as an enemy. But the other come to me as a friend, you know? And uh, for example, you know, when we were children, uh, the magic was the bad, you know, like 
in the story of Cinderella, if, if you know it, <laughs> you know, usually the, 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 the magician is the bad person. But in Harry Potter, the magic is actually the good person. It's what's helping, what's saving, you know. Here, actually, how they, they brainwash the people. They, they present the evil as good. And that's why it's more dangerous. But in terrorism, they say, I am evil. But here, in all these secular ideas and philosophies, they say it's not evil. Actually, the evil is good. And that's why the Lord said, woe to those who say to evil good and to good evil. Woe to those who say to the darkness light and light darkness. That's what the secular ideology is doing. And this is more dangerous on our children and on our you know, community than uh, you know, the, the, the real enemy. You want to say something? OK, George. لا جورج لا هو مش انت عايز تقول حاجه؟ طب قول اوكي سو اون ذا هاري بوتر ثينج بس هي كده الليكشر خلصت استوى في ثيري بعد اذنك سيد اي ثينك وي كان جست تيك وان لاست كويستشن فور ذا سيك اوف كونتينيوتي اند وي جو اون اوكي ان ذا هاري بوتر ثينج ذير واز باد ماجيك اند ذير واز جود ماجيك ذير از نو جود ماجيك بات هاري واز Well, not there is no, in, not I'm, telling, our, I'm our, telling you, there is no good magic. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like, in their perspective, there was good magic and there was the bad magic. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you, the idea of good magic is bad. I think I think I think what you're saying I think what you're saying is the driving forces of some of the good sides of the magic were good things were good virtues the um, strongest power in the entire series is love Harry Potter in the storyline he survived because of the love and the sacrifice of his mother is sacrifice not a good trait like something that's a good thing okay. and they're good aspects of the series what's wrong with this ideology is that you can get love or you get this virtue from God you know. Yeah, actually, God is love. So if I'm, I'm, I'm taking love and ascribing it to the magic, actually that is denial. You know, I take what belongs to you and give it to Satan. And says, you know, Satan is loving. Satan is not loving. You know, love here, yes, love is good. But who is love? Is it magic or God? It's God. You know, if it is God, why I ascribe this? to magic. You know, this is actually giving uh, credit to the bad, which is wrong. wrong. Right? I, I know you like Harry Potter. You know? I, I know. I, yes. I think what he was trying to say is that love it was not ascribed to magic, uh, but rather magic could not defeat the, the power of love. And yes, um, but I need to give the, the credit yes, the to God. Yes, the concept of love in, in a secular society will never ascribe love to God. Um, and this and is I, dangerous and because you, you, you say you mentioned Cinderella. Cinderella has nothing to do with God, correct? Yeah, you know no, the story. No, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not saying uh, Cinderella is, is a good or bad story. But mm -hmm. I'm saying in but these it's stories, story. it's a fiction, right? In, in these stories, mm -hmm. you know, magic was ascribed as evil, not as good. Okay, this is not a church history, Cinderella. <laughs> uh, we don't read it in like Syria. So I'm not saying, you know, it, it, it's good or bad story, but I'm saying how the culture changed it. You know, even the culture, even the culture, instead of ascribing evil to magic, now ascribing love to magic, which is wrong. I'm gonna. Yes. Uh, خلينا نخلص. Now we said uh, obstacles, obstacles to evangelism. Number one, improper perception of evangelism. Number two, improper uh, understanding of the gospel. Number three, improper uh, uh, view of the priesthood. Number four, uh, it's self-righteousness. What do I mean by self-righteousness? Uh, 
sometimes we, we understand the gospel, yes, it's the power of God of salvation, but it's the power of God of salvation because I am good. That's why the, the Bible helped me, you know. But the, the, in, do you think there is hope in this person? No, there is no hope. You know, he's, he's bad. He, he is a sinner. You know, like the mentality of the Pharisee. She's a sinner. Actually, if she's a sinner, she needs Jesus. But he said, why he's talking to her? She's a sinner. So the gospel is only for the righteous people. And this is actually exactly opposite when the Lord said, no, I did not come to call righteous, but to call sinners. That's why if I am humble, and if I perceive myself as a sinner, then actually I say, as the word of, of the gospel worked for me and transformed me, so I am the first among the sinners, then actually everybody in the world needs the word of God. Of, of God. Not only a certain category, not, certain, not only a certain group, but everybody needs the word of God. Uh, St. Paul actually, when he spoke about himself, he, he, he described himself as the first among sinners, the chief among sinners. And as the chief among sinners, which means everybody else is better than me. Everybody else in the world is better than me. And if the word of God saved me, then actually everybody else needs the word of God. And it will save them because they are better than me. That's why I said it is obstacle when I think you know, self-righteously about uh, myself. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, from uh, verse 13 to 17, this saying is tr uh, trustworthy and deserving of all This saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance. Deserving of all acceptance. What is it? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the first most. He understood himself as the first most among the sinners. But I received the mercy for this reason. That in me, that in me, as the foremost as the foremost among the sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So he's saying, God had mercy upon me. Why? To tell me that you are the foremost among the sinners. See how the word of the gospel worked in you and how the word of gospel transformed you so as the word of gospel transformed you, it will transform everybody else. If, if everybody else. So if God would save a sinner like me, then anyone actually is at the reach of God. Nobody is beyond the reach of God's grace. Nobody. If the word of God saved me, I am the chief among sinners, then actually nobody is beyond the reach of God's mercy and God's grace. That's why St. Paul felt eager and under obligation to share the word of the gospel with everybody else. Uh, number uh, five, fear. What do I mean by fear? Yes, with evangelism, there is a cost. And the Lord said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Uh, sometimes I want to evangelize, but without paying any cost. If, if this will cost my job, no, I'm not going to evangelize. If this cost my life, I'm not going to evangelize. I'm not going to evangelize. But 
uh, actually, the word martyrdom, martyrdom means uh, to witness for Christ and, and to evangelize, to bear witness for, for Christ. Yes, we need to be wise. We need to be wise in, in approaching. That's why the Lord told us, you know, be wise as serpent, but harmless as doves. So, uh, I will try to evangelize in a wise way, but in the same time, if this, there is a cost, I'm willing to suffer this for the spread of the gospel of Christ. Many times they said to St. Paul, you need to leave. And they made him leave, or they hide him. You know? uh, and the Lord told us, if you went to a city and they did not accept you, go to another city. So I want you to keep the balance between how to evangelize wisely, but in the same time, if the cost will be uh, paid, even if it's my life, I'm willing to, to, to accept this cost. So I, I, I'm not just putting myself in situations that will cost me, although there is another way to evangelize wisely, but in the same time, I'm not escaping from the cost. This balance is very, very important. But many times, actually, uh, maybe the cost uh, of, of being like judgmental. Sometimes, uh, you know, I say, if I say to my friend comes to church, I will sound judgmental. No. So I, I don't just to be called judgmental. That's why uh, even I don't want to accept this cost. You know, or I don't want to impose on others people. Or um, something like, you know, everybody has his own freedom and his choice. And usually I explain it like this. Now, if you, if you want to go to Tampa and Clearwater, uh, the direction is to go take four west. You know, if you take 95 north, you will end up in New Jersey. So if you find, you know, a friend that you really care about him, and he wants to go to Tampa, but you took 95 uh, north instead of four west, are you going to say, you know, I don't want to be judgmental? You know, if I tell him this wrong, I I'm judging him. Uh, I need to respect his uh, choice. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to impose my belief on him. Of course, you will not do this. You will tell him, listen, here is a map. You are not going to Tampa. If you are going to Tampa, you need to drive this way. This is not judgmental. This is not uh, imposing your opinion on him. It's not a, uh, an opinion. This is not, not respecting his freedom of choice. But simply, this is love. This is love. You love him. You care about him. You care about his eternal life. So if the other person wants to be saved and he wants to drive his life toward heaven, actually, you need to give him the right direction, the right direction to lead him to heaven. Number uh, six, division. Uh, in, in the Lord's Prayer, in John chapter 17, he said, uh, I don't ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, just as you, Father, are one in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So this oneness, this unity, will make the world believe that God the Father sent his only begotten Son to save the world. And then he said, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. Twice, in John chapter 17, he repeated, that the world may know that you sent me. So actually, our unity or lack of it makes a huge, a huge difference because the world is watching. When the people come and they find the church dividing against each other, fighting with each other, there are parties in the church, groups in the church, division in the church, you know, they will not believe that he sent him. That's why the Lord said, 
to us in John 13, verse 35. Actually, thus the world will know that you are my disciples. What's the qualifier here? If you love one another. If you love one another. Maybe some of you will ask and say, okay, what about the unity of the churches? Can we witness to non-Christian while there are many, many denominations? You know, unity should be founded on, again, uh, wrong, uh, sound doctrines, you know. We cannot found unity on wrong doctrines. No. That's why the Lord who spoke about unity, he said himself that I came not to bring peace but a sword. And I will divide, uh, turn the, the son against his father, mother. When this will happen? When there is actually a disagreement in, in, the, in the doctrines. You know? So the Lord who spoke about unity and oneness, he is the same Lord who spoke about bringing a sword. Why? It is because of the uh, doctrine of faith. I cannot compromise the doctrine of faith. Otherwise, it will be false unity. It will not be hard. It will not be a true unity. You know? So here the Lord spoke yes, about unity and oneness. As St. Paul said, one faith, one baptism. But in the same way, St. Paul actually fought against the Judaizers. The Judaizers are those who want actually to make a division by bringing Jewish tradition and imposing the Jewish tradition on the, the Jews. Let me say the last point, and I will take your question. Number seven, and the last point, actually one of you said it yesterday, laziness or apathy. You know, this actually uh, can be one of the reasons why we don't preach. You know, we are apath apathetic, lukewarm. We are lazy, just we are comfortable doing nothing. We are comfortable doing nothing. Uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then they will call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So how many... Uh, beautiful feet we have, uh, beautiful feet. As he said, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Uh, as Paul was just saying, now we are in this conference, attend the conference, then tomorrow everybody will go home and then we'll go back to our comfort zone. Whether I'm clergy or whether I am a lay person, you know, we'll go to our comfort zone until next year in the next convention and we'll come and have good time together and that's it. No. We need actually to have this eagerness, this sense of obligation. We should put our apathy, our complacencies, our, our lukewarmness aside, and we should take it on our hearts, how to be committed, how to be zealous, how to be eager to, to preach and share the word of the gospel with everybody. So in summary, these are the seven uh, obstacles. Um, uh, improper view of evangelism, improper view of gospel, improper view of priesthood, uh, self-righteousness, fear, division, and laziness. Yes, Amir. Yes, uh, in regards to point number six, division, uh, like we had some examples before, like in early Christianity, like when Paul did not want to take Mark with him because they left him in Pamphylia, and then after that, they turned it out be this was planned from God, because he went preach somewhere else and it's not planned yeah. from God, but yeah. let me rephrase what you said. Yeah. God sure. used even our weakness, yeah. you know, for goodness. So our weakness, which is planned by God, yeah. but God used our weakness to bring something good out of it. And, you know, so I cannot say God planned this division. No, God did not plan the division. But God used our weakness and even our division to, to spread the, the, the gospel into more countries, because he is uh, beneficent, you know, yeah. maker of good, yes. Another example, when, like, when Paul criticized Peter because he was kind of afraid of the Jew, avoid eating, uh, eating with the Gentiles and stuff like that. Basically, I see Paul was right. However, his criticism might have caused division also in the church. But here, here he was criticizing him over doctrine. It's, uh, that's why I said, in doctrine, yes. 
You know, God said, I, I'll bring sword, not, 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 not peace. You know, I cannot just uh, uh, sugarcoat my words when I speak about doctrines. So it just it gets me to my question now. When I'm in church, I show it should be, we should be like the general character, meekness, obedience. However, when we can say, no, this is not right. Yeah, there is, there is time to speak, time to be silent, you know. All, all, all Christian virtues without discernment, as St. Anthony said, it will be uh, turned to a vice. So if I am meek and silent, even when there is truth should be revealed, this is wrong. So when I am silent, uh, like, like Pop Shunoda when he said, if St. Athanasius was silent during the time of Arius, we would lose Christianity. But he, he chose to, to speak. So here is the discernment, when I should speak and when I should be silent, when I, I, I should be bold and when I should be quiet. Discernment. Yes. Can we uh, uh, define uh, another barrier for uh, uh, evangelism? Is the uh, laws and boundaries which we are living now in countries and uh, there are certain laws, regulations, boundaries like uh, in some countries, China, Saudi. Yeah. Uh, so this actually, is it related to fear or it's not related to the point of fear because Actually, I see it not related because we are not fearing to go, but there are certain boundaries and certain laws we well, have to respect. So, so is this to respect the laws of countries mean that we don't breach or? What? That's why I said here, maybe we need to be wise. There is not only one approach to, to evangelize. There is a story, maybe uh, most of you uh, heard it, I don't know if it's a real story or just, you know, a story to make a point about a Christian professor in, when Japan. in, in, in Japan and they instructed him not to speak yes. about his uh, religion. And then at the end of the semester, everybody said, we want to be Christian. And, and he never spoke a word, but people, when they saw him and they saw his example, uh, you know, do you remember when George told you how many gospels yesterday? Yeah. You know, yeah. so there is a fifth gospel, yeah. which is you. So you can preach. You know, by your example. Preaching is not only by the word. Preaching by example. Preaching by prayer. Preaching by serving others. Preaching by uh, the fellowship. By our unity. You know, so there are different forms of preaching. So the rules and boundaries will prohibit me from one way, which is preaching by word. But will never prohibit me from showing Christ in me. But maybe you become the fifth gospel. But maybe you because we have the uh, 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 the picture of St. Paul of going even in the uh, countries or uh, cities where it was forbidden as well to breach there, and he uh, was stoned and he was. Uh, uh, they told him go out. So it was the same. So yeah, sh here sh is shall we we make yes. the same approach? Yeah, here is, here is the like wisdom. St. Paul went based on clear messages from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, he says, the Spirit prevented me from going here. The Spirit told me. So through prayer and through submitting myself to the will of God and through listening to the voice of God through the channels, the Bible, my spiritual father, all the channels that I have, then if the Spirit asks me to go, I will go. If no, the Spirit, this is an uh, important yes. point. Yes, yes. Okay. told me don't, then I'm not. Uh, your grace, uh, in addition, there are uh, new methods nowadays. For example, internet. We can reach many people through internet, Facebook, uh, and others. Uh, in the past, we were uh, bounded by certain boundaries. For example, Saudi Arabia now, many, and in Islamic countries in general, many come to Christ through internet or through TV. Or Absolutely. So there are other yes. methods yeah. available nowadays. M many methods. Uh, satellite, like CYC. <laughs> CYC. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>